Welcome to my talk, South Cushitic in Inner Mbugu, Historical Linguistics and Linguistic History in the Tanzanian Rift. Let us begin on the road from Babati town to Arusha, which I've chosen for the view of the sheer escarpment, sometimes visible here to the left. Keep in mind that it is at the top of the escarpment, up on the Mbulu Plateau, that the Iraq people's traditional homeland is located, whereas it is down in the lowland where the Gorwa people's traditional homeland is located, an area referred to as the Maasai Steppe. In Mouse 2003, a detailed, empirically-based analysis of both grammar and linguistic history, it is identified that within the mixed language register of the Mbugu people, known as Inner Mbugu, a significant number of words come from South Cushitic, spe specifically the sub-branch of South Cushitic called Iroquois, that is, the group containing the Gorwa and Iraq languages. Over the course of Mouse 2003, it is assumed that the South Cushitic source came from Gorwa rather than Iraq. It is further hypothesized that this language contact took the form of Gorwa-speaking people becoming incorporated into Mbugu society as the result of war. With the aim of exploring one specific and small-scale element of the linguistic history of East Africa, this talk will examine both elements of this hypothesis. I'll start by establishing a few essential pieces of context, primarily about the inner Mbugu language, as well as the nature of the proposed contact. With this in place, the talk will then examine the South Cushitic in the inner Mbugu lexicon, examining if, based on this evidence, we can establish whether the ultimate source was Gorwa or Iraq. Having examined lexical evidence, we will then turn to an altogether different kind of evidence, that of oral tradition, to try and answer questions about the social nature of this language contact. And finally, we will conclude. Before all of this, however, I'd like to say that a recording of this talk will be made available shortly after its live presentation, both on Zenodo at the DOI Given, as well as on YouTube via the QR code on screen. To start, I'd like to provide a bit of context about who I am. This is a photo from back in 2015 of myself and Bu Sahware, a speaker of Gorwa, at a rock shelter talking about rock art. I'm a linguist interested in the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. I've been conducting language documentation in this part of Tanzania since around 2012, and the speaker communities with whom I work primarily are Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Hadza. The wider topic of today's talk, South Cushitic in Inner Mbugu, is interesting to me because it provides a chance to apply data collected during my work with Gorwa to analysis of a proposed case of language contact within the larger region. The Mbugu people live in the western Usambara Mountains, a lushly forested and densely inhabited area known for its high biodiversity. These images are from a hiking trip across the Usambaras I took as a 23-year-old back in 2011 during the University of Dar es Salaam's spring break. Here is a short recording of Inner Mbugu kindly shared to me by Martin, uh, in which William Mboko starts a story about uh, an encounter in the forest. Itlego nithewe, William, iazeiwe, nekuli, Kingo sa jacha mageri sa ikuminanu nilita na i magamba nitaho ya hengwe ni hehare hekwali nteko kigichi ni dosa lia nhe sungri ya kwa ngau sana ngoni yaho ni tuhe tuhe ye kuka amasame na ana idumu kuni wesia honi agae kaini mgitutu ku kuzidi u basi muru kunigaa kwa tone loi kotigo long oroye na ibirangeti na ndate Prior to Mouse 2003, the predominant assumption was that inner Mbugu could be explained as a case of language attrition in which a Cushitic language, labeled here Old Mbugu, 
was being overlaid by a new Bantu language, here labeled New Mbugu, which corresponds to the normal Mbugu of the literature. We therefore have the case of a Cushitic substrate language contributing lexical material and a Bantu superstrate language contributing morphosyntactic material. What Mouse 2003 argues, however, is that this is, in fact, not the case. Instead, there is no Cushitic substrate language to speak of. That is, the speakers of that original Cushitic language, whatever it was, had stopped speaking it completely and had entirely switched to speaking the new language, normal Mbugu. What happened now, after the original Cushitic language became dormant and could not be retrieved, was that the Mbugu people decided, despite the fact that they had lost virtually all connection to the previous language which they spoke, to create a new language that signaled their difference from the speakers of this new Bantu language that was now dominant in the area. To do this, they used the resources that they had on hand, adopting lexical items from languages including the Nilotic language Maasai, as well as Cushitic lexical material from at least three sources, and putting this new lexical lexicon on top of the morphosyntactic scaffold of the normal Mbugu that they had shifted to. As such, what they created was a language with a lexus of diverse sources, a radical form of language reawakening, reconnecting with their past by creating a new language which showed their more than Bantu roots. Today, we'll be focusing on one specific part of this diverse lexus, that being the material identified as South Cushitic. The two principal hypotheses made about the South Cushitic component in Inner Mbugu are as follows. Uh, that, uh, quote, it is assumed that the Southern Cushitic source from the Inner Mbugu lexicon was Gorwa rather than Iraq. And uh, a second hypothesis, uh, one of the significant Words from Gorwa Iraq is mlage, which means mother in Inner Mbugu and cow acquired in war in Iraq and presumably Gorwa. This suggests that a number of women entered Mbugu society at times of conflict between the Mbugu and the Gorwa Iraq. We will address the first hypothesis by revisiting South Cushitic in the Inner Mbugu lexicon. Starting from the Mbugu lexicon, which is an appendix to Mouse 2003, uh, of the 2,300 headwords listed, I isolated what I identified as 105 forms of interest. This involved identifying all 129 headwords that were identified therein with possible South Cushitic etima, and first of all, subtracting eight forms which were derived from other forms, such as the inner Mbugu onika, posited to derive from oni. Next, I subtracted 23 forms which Eret lists as linked to South Cushitic, but Mouse does not. I largely agree here in that most of these forms are etymologically spurious, such as the link with the Mbugu form Bidula, turn over with the Iraq Berang, fresh milk. In my view, Bidula is most certainly from a Bantu source. Compare the Swahili Pindua for overturn. I then subtracted nine forms uh, further, which Mouse links to South Cushitic, but which I find etymologically doubtful. For example, rather than the inner Mbugu form Minyi, child, linking to the Iraq or Gorwa Na'ai, child, it is more likely a version of the words of the regional archetype Mungenya, whose ultimate origin is currently unclear and about which I've spoken in a previous presentation. Finally, I added 16 forms which had no proposed South Cushitic link in Mouse 2003, but which I found etymologically plausible. Take, for example, the Mbugu form oni for to spoil, for which I see a link in the Gorwa form om to dry up. Another example is the Mbugu form dota, maybe, which exists in Gorwa and Iraq as doga and means the same thing. Of this, uh, there was a list of 105 forms of interest, and uh, approximately 93 were the same in both Gorwa and Iraq, with 12 forms having different forms in Gorwa and Iraq. 
The 93 forms which in Iraq and Gorwa are equivalent are of limited use to us answering today's question. For example, the inner Mbugu form U, meaning force, is almost certainly from either Gorwa or Iraq, but because the form is the same in both languages, Uru, we cannot tell which one. The same is true for the inner Mbugu war word for liar, Mlame. The form is the same in both Gorwa and Iraq, Lama lie, and as such, we cannot know its ultimate origin. Our interest instead lies in this smaller set of 12 forms where there is a difference in the Gorwa and Iraq forms. As, uh, as it is here, we can make a judgment about source. Uh, first of this set, I found two inner Mbugu forms where the Iraq source is more plausible. For example, the inner Mbugu Uma stand resembles the Iraq form Um stop, whereas I could not find a cognate form in my Gorwa data thus far. Further, the inner Mbugu form for night, ama, seems closer to the Iraq form amsa than the Gorwa form amsi. As such, in these cases, an Iraq or origin is slightly more likely. For the remaining 10 tokens, the inverse is true. That is, a Gorwa source is more plausible than an Iraq source. Take the following two examples. The first is more plausible because, as noted in 2003, there is a Gorwa verb of the form kwahas, to rest, whereas no such form exists in Iraq. In the second example, tongue, the semantics of the cognate form in Gorwa, that is, taste, seems closer to the semantics of the form in inner Mbugu rather than this form in Iraq. As such, the Gorwa source is more plausible here. Finally, and perhaps most convincingly, are forms like the following. The form uh, for to milk in inner Mbugu, uh, which is ule, uh, matches the noun milk in Gorwa more closely than the same form in Iraq. So in Gorwa we have ulwa, and in Iraq we have ilwa. Similarly, the same applies for the word meaning roughly small room or hut. So in inner Mbugu, we have asha'u, uh, whereas in Gorwa, we have ashang, and in Iraq, we have ishang. Here, one might say that the difference is just one vowel. What does it matter? Uh, but in fact, it makes all the difference, as this operation is a consistent historical sound change dubbed regressive transliquid vowel assimilation, which occurs in Gorwa but did not occur in Iraq. As such, if these forms in inner Mbugu feature forms with the regressive transliquid vowel assimilation, it is very good evidence indeed that the ultimate origin of these words in inner Mbugu was Gorwa. Having provided support for the first hypothesis that yes, South Cushitic material in Inner Mbugu seems to come from Gorwa rather than Iraq, I would like now to turn to the second hypothesis. First, I can confirm that the form Mlage does exist in Gorwa and therefore gives us impetus to examine the rest of the hypothesis, that is, that Gorwa speakers became incorporated into the Mbugu community uh, specifically through war. To do this, we will use a different kind of data and employ a different type of methodology. We'll start with the primary data, the Gorwa lightning story. As can be seen from the video, uh, the video did not come to me in one piece. Rather, it came as a series of parts or an overall vaguely remembered story from five separate men who each told the story in five slightly different ways. In the process of cobbling together a single version of the story, I've developed the following English version, which reads, Long ago, in the past, before the Gorwa people had a chief, there was a famine. The people looked amongst themselves until one said, Ihi! That lightning! The people knew that lightning had rain. To the west, we shall follow the lightning. 
Many people left, like a whole village, and they were all from the clans Ma'angwai and Har Thawai. But in those days, there were no village quarters. People left in small groups, and they gathered together in the wilderness and went. These people of the famine had no leader. The hunger led them on. They walked and walked and walked, but there was no rain. They climbed the hill, and when they looked there, the lightning flickers weeds at the ridge of the next mountain. When they got there, the land was dry, so they continued ahead. As far as they were concerned, where the lightning flashed, there was rain. When they wanted to turn back, they were lost, and so they returned to the path and continued following the lightning. The lightning was followed until today and tomorrow and to the day after tomorrow. It was unobtainable. It was thought that they would return, but where did they go? Where did they go? Where did they go? A certain person named Aito once went far away looking for medicine. When he came back, he said, I found some Gorwa people. Gorwa people, but their language is now a different one. It has changed. We asked each other, and they say, Yum, 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 gorwa. Yum, 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 gorwa. Using this version as a starting point, I'd like now to look at how it related to the second hypothesis we are examining, that is, that Gorwa speakers became integrated into the Mbugu community through warfare. I'll start with details that seem to militate against that hypothesis, and then data that argue in favor of it. First, the direction in which the people moved is not straightforward. In all versions, the movement was from Galapo village, a village in the current Gorwa-speaking area, uh, but this is where the consensus ends. Most of the versions describe a westerly migration, whereas one of the versions, in fact the most detailed account, describes a migration to the north. For reference, Mbugu is currently spoken here, uh, whereas Gorwa is currently spoken here. On this map, the possibility of contact seems outlandish, but the assumption is that this contact may have occurred before the Mbugu people moved into the mountains, and instead happened out on the Maasai steppe, at a time during which the Mbugu may have been living with the Maasai people, possibly as indentured slaves. This photo, taken from Lutindi Peak in the eastern Usambaras, looking southwest across the Luangara Valley and onto the Maasai Steppe, shows that though the Usambaras present a challenge for easy movement, the lowlands at their foot do not. At any rate, a westerly migration route for the people following the lightning from the Gorwa-speaking area would probably not be good evidence, but a northerly one wouldn't be impossible. The next piece of evidence against this story being linkable to Gorwa and Bugu contact is the fact that in no version of this story was the cause of migration war. Instead, it is always famine caused by drought. Next, the time of the migration is not agreed upon. Most versions simply frame it as long, long ago, whereas two versions move it into the more historical past of the line of the current rulers, Dodod. Vancina 1985 reminds us that as we recede from the present into the past, the number of discrete eras of time into which we can place a given oral account begin to decrease, moving from the datable eras of historical time to increasingly vague eras of mythical time, until a given oral account slips across the horizon into a mythical past. This seems to be what is occurring with the lightning story. Finally, the Gorwa lightning story may not be Gorwa at all, or at least may not be exclusively Gorwa. This short version is included in Berger and Kiesling's 1998 collection of Iraq texts. Vansina calls these narratives that belong to more than one group Vandasagan. Uh, this seems to make things much more complicated indeed. I'll now consider elements that seem to be in favor of the hypothesis of the Gorwa Mbugu contact being as a result of conflict. The first is the possibility of lightning as metaphor. We know, for example, that a set of taboos exist in Gorwa society which, if broken, put the individual at risk of being struck by lightning. Additionally, the breaking of other sets of taboos can result in conflict, which in many stories of the past took its form in incursions by the Maasai people who were feared throughout the larger region for their warlike nature and their propensity to steal both cattle and women. 
If the, Mbu if the Mbugu were living in indentured servitude to the Maasai, and if the Maasai are represented by lightning here, the irresistible pull of lightning in this story could very well be a way of encoding the coercive pull of the Maasai people enacted on the Gorwa people. Overall, our understanding of the concepts of rain, drought, and fertility in the region is poorly understood. I've linked to a talk which takes some initial steps to a regional understanding of this pluvial universe above. Perhaps, however, the piece of the story most amenable to the hypothesis of mbugu gorwa contact is the final part, which provides an image of a Gorwa traveler many years after the fact, encountering a group of people who say that they are Gorwa but can no longer speak Gorwa comprehensible to him. This is an enticing image, but then again, just the kind of evocative flourish that a good storyteller may build on to the end of a story to add some further depth. To conclude then, this talk focused on a component of the diverse lexus of inner Mbugu deemed to be South Cushitic in origin, aiming to address the following two hypotheses. Linguistically, that this component of the inner Mbugu lexicon came into inner Mbugu through Gorwa rather than Iraq, and socio-historically that this Gorwa Mbugu contact happened as a result of conflict. Through revi revisiting the South Cushitic component in the inner Mbugu lexicon, there is good linguistic evidence to assume that these forms did, in part or in whole, come into inner Mbugu through Gorwa. Particularly persuasive was evidence of a subset of forms having undergone regressive transliquid vowel assimilation, a historical process which took place in Gorwa and did not take place in Iraq. Through studying a single Gorwa story, the lightning story, the evidence that this contact was in the context of warfare was harder to prove. Challenges associated with handling oral tradition as history are evident, but at the same time, hints of deeper metaphoric meaning offer tantalizing prospects for engaging in a more systemic study of the body of Gorwa linguistic arts. Before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the bodies which funded the research I talked about today, as well as Stefano Edward, the Gorwa local researcher who collected, translated, and transcribed the instances of the lightning story used here today, and all the Gorwa people who contributed to this research, especially those who appeared during the course of the presentation. William Mboko, who was the voice we heard on the inner Mbugu recording, as well as his father, Raphael Mboko, whose image we saw, uh, deserve thanks. And finally, thanks to Martin Maus, the LHEAF uh, conference organizers, as well as all the members and hangers-on who made this project so impactful over the past six years. Thank you, and here are my references.